Good afternoon, welcome. This is the July 1st, 2024 work session of the Salisbury City Council. In the event of an emergency, we ask that everyone remain calm and exit through the doors to your right and proceed to the right and down the stairs. If the hallway is blocked, ex exit to your left and down the hall and down the stairs. Please do not use the elevator and let us know if you need any assistance. At this time, we ask that everyone please silence your cell phones. Public comments will be heard after each work session item. If you plan to speak, please fill out a form on the table near the door you came in and give it to the city clerk, Kim Nichols. And I want to say hello to our Councilwoman Jackson, who is, is back joining us virtually. Glad to have you back briefly, Councilwoman Jackson. <laughs> yeah, just briefly, because I'm in pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, we don't, don't overdo it. Well, we'll get, uh, get started with the training and development presentation by Casey Lingle. She's the, our human resources specialist in charge of training and development. Good afternoon, Casey. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. So for the record, I'm Casey Lingle. I'm the HR specialist for training and development, and I'll be super short and sweet. But a few months ago, Deshaun thought it would be a good idea to present to you guys basically what I do for city employees. So Deshaun, I think you are the clicker for me. <laughs> so briefly, just some onboarding things that we do. We do a 30-day survey, so I meet or try to meet with every single employee. Sometimes that's difficult just depending on the nature of their job. And I just make sure that they know their benefits, essentially, that they're comfortable communicating and that they're comfortable at the city of Salisbury. And then at the 60 day mark, they receive an email from me and it's a brief survey that they can do on their phone or on a computer and the results come to me. They don't have to meet me unless you know, I see anything <coughs> concerning from the feedback they give. And then at 90 days, that is actually for the supervisor. They meet with the new hire and they're supposed to go over a very brief goal setting, development, those types of issues at 90 days, just to make sure that the next three months go well. At the six month mark, then they receive a probationary appraisal. Yeah. <laughs> And then just a few things I wanted to highlight that I think I'm most proud of. The speech workshops I've been doing over the past six months. Uh, you can see there we've had 50 participants and that's actually probably a little low because I just had one last week. And that one was a little more difficult because I gave them three weeks to prepare and they had to speak for five minutes. So that one was a little different. So we're at maybe 55 participants, but they go very, very well. It's people that are very introverted and don't like to speak in public and they get better every single time they come back. So that's actually, I think, one of my, um, my highlights of my career is being able to see that. We also have a leadership core training, and that just goes over seven behaviors that research shows it makes a good manager. I've kind of flipped it around and said it makes a good human. You can use it inside and outside the workplace. So I do those as well, and you can see 55 people have participated in that. Uh, how, how do you choose the participants for those two? Um, I send it out to all city staff, so okay. whoever would like to sign up. Okay. I have started some leadership book studies and I have five other books in the works. I've been trying to prepare for at least the next six to a year um, in advance. So we actually have another book study coming up in August, every Wednesday in August. We're actually going to be meeting for two hours, so a little different than what the screen says. But we did our first leadership book club about a month ago, two months ago now, and it went really well. We had 10 participants um, and it actually ranged from, you know, department directors the whole way down to entry level. Uh, the feedback was great, so I'm going to continue with different books and continue doing that. The next one, I think I only have four spots left out of 12, so that one's booking up too. And then I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, that can be for anything. Obviously, career and develop development is what my position is, so it is aligned to career and development. But I'm a very holistic person, so I can coach them on whatever their needs may be because if they're not doing well at the workplace, maybe something underlying is going on. So I do a lot of coaching. And that might be it. I think there might be one more slide. 
<coughs> some things that are coming down the works is hopefully I will have a logo to make us super official. We are calling it the SBY Cares University. So essentially what we, we would like to see happen is to actually have an in-house university where we have like a catalog of classes that our employees can look at and take in the future to make it super official. We're not quite there yet, uh, but we're getting there. We will have some supervisor workshops, round tables, and then it's okay. Um, and then some team building workshops that will be coming up. So. Good. Uh, so what, uh, well, first of all, I commend you for one, taking the initiative, and I think this is good. Um, and I've, I've been watching, you know, from the background, and I know when we had budget, we, uh, council had questions, and we wanted to learn more about that. So thank you for providing this, this uh, presentation for us. Um, and we're looking forward to, at least I know I am, I'm looking forward to this, this to grow, because again, we can see the growth directly with our employees. Um, council, any other questions or, or comments? I just really love this idea. I think it's I great. Too. It's it's a very holistic way of, of bringing people on board. I'd love to see the council adopt something for, for new council members, <laughs> yeah. honestly, similar to this, because frankly, I mean, that process could use some improvement. Um, you know, I, I, I really love what you're doing with this. This is fantastic. Thank you. Are you, so just because uh, that's like my background, are there any metrics you can use to um, see, like, see what growth, um, is there a way to, you can track what you're doing is, is kind of in the right steps? I do feedback surveys, okay. but I am looking forward to more strategic planning, uh, maybe once the transition um, with directors and stuff slows down a bit. Um, in the past, we have strategic planned with the mayor's office, so I look forward to doing that and kind of pinpointing some things. Um, but I do feedback surveys almost every single class just to see if I can change anything or you know if they enjoyed it. <clears throat> Just from an anecdotal standpoint, we've had some um, supervisors, some people who have been who've struggled. So we've done some performance improvement plans. But this, through some coaching with Casey, we've had people who've shown significant signs of improvement and even retention, may, stay in the positions at the R based off of the stuff that she's done. So it may not be a direct metric, but from an HR standpoint, we are seeing the successes and, and staff are are complimenting her and um, and are excited about what they're able to do to uh, to continue to work with the city so yeah and, and I know we, we said it back in budget but anything that we can do in the council level to help it out you know you have ideas so anything we can do you know at, at incremental steps we, we definitely support that because again we want to see our employees and our, our teammates and our directors and everyone grow so uh, let us know what other ideas you have and bring it to us we're excited to hear it so yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, any other uh, public comments online or in person? April. April, yes. Councilwoman Jackson. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Casey, thank so you. much for what you do, and and the HR, see the HR team back there. Thank you all for supporting as well. Yes. All right. We'll move forward to our landline necessity discussion. We'll bring up our, our procurement director, Jennifer Miller, with our interim director of information services, uh, Steve Dickerson. Hello to you both. Hello. Hello. Okay. So I'm at your mercy. What would you like to talk about? <laughs> this was. Uh, I believe this was a uh, from our budget um, about is if. What the, the landline looked like, what you know, I know the transition. I know uh, I caught that. I'm not sure if Councilwoman DeShield caught that on the tail end of her coming in, but uh -huh. uh, just kind of bring us up to speed on you know um, the cost effectiveness of it and kind of where we are with the phone lines and uh, with the two buildings here. Okay, all right. So in total, um, uh, the the billing has settled down between uh, what we used to pay from on Verizon landlines to the Verizon VoIP or OneTalk system, okay? Um, looking at total savings, um, we had a cost avoidance of approximately $138,000. That was strictly in the hardware to, to get new desk phones. Remember, our desk phones were going to be end of life, um, I believe at sometime in 2026, so FY20. 25 would have had to be that year where we were looking at a significant capital expense just to purchase new desk phones, okay? Uh, over and above that, landline cost versus what I call Verizon One Talk cost, um, about an average yearly savings of about $20,000, okay? We had a, a one-time uh, uh, bill incentive credit of another $16,000. 
So, uh, and then over and above that, uh, we have the cost avoidance of, uh, we'll say, maintenance. So with this Verizon One Talk plan, they utilize an outside company right now called Masters Telecom. Masters Telecom provides us with, <coughs> I want to say maintenance and repair. If any phone troubleshooting type issues um, that we used to contract with a third party provider, we don't have uh, that fee anymore. That range is about twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year. That um, is at, at no cost now as well. Now I know one of the things that you you know you I think you had the idea of would we save anything yes. you know if if we had maybe less desk phones. Sure. I don't know how to answer that for you other than to maybe give you some data okay. in terms of what we already <clears throat> have. So right now we have approximately 231 personal desk phones. Okay, we have other phones. We have phones that are assigned to conference rooms, break rooms, um, what else, training rooms, and so on. I didn't include those in that number. We have about 103 of those. Okay, so a phone in a conference room or a training room somewhere. Okay, so approximately 231 personal phones. All right. Over and above that, now let's talk a little bit about cell phones. Oh, let me go back here. On those um, desk phones, we pay about $20 a month. It's $18 plus taxes and fees per phone. Now, there are some other charges, for instance, if the department has what's called an auto attendant, you dial a number and it says press one for so-and-so, press two for so-and-so. So there's a fee for that as well, okay? All right, over and above that. We have city-issued cell phones, or some folks, I believe on the recommendation of city administration, can have what's called a cell phone stipend, okay? So if somebody is issued a city cell phone, we have 47 cell phone holders. That's with Verizon Wireless. That fee per month is about $40 a month, okay, for that service, for that person. Okay, so most of those are that $40 a month fee. We're talking a smartphone. There are a few folks that have uh, dumb phones, the flip phones, and uh, um, they're, <laughs> so, so they're a little bit lesser of a cost. But, you know, 47 phones, approximately 40 bucks a piece, okay? Um, we also have the cell phone stipends. They are folks that aren't issued a city cell phone, but receive $20 a month toward the cost of their own cell phone, okay? Um, oddly enough, we have 47 of those. Same number. What's this? The same number. Yeah, that's, I <laughs> just noticed that. Now, of the 47 folks that have city-issued cell phone, city-issued cell phones, I have a note here that in looking at who they are, they likely also have a desk phone. Um, the folks that have the cell phone stipends, again, they, it's hard to know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure again, who has, you know, does every single person on that list have a city desk phone as well? Now, um, I, I can say, too, for the city-issued cell phones, there is an additional cost that the Department of Information Services, um, they, they have a management plan, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? Correct. Yeah, we, um, a few years ago when we were issuing iPads, we realized that we needed to have some sort of central management system for the iPads. Um, Basically, what was happening was we were issuing iPads out, and when we would get them back, when an employee would leave, the iPads would be locked, and we weren't able to unlock them. Even Apple would not unlock them for us. So we decided that we needed to manage these iPads in some way. If we went to city-issued cell phones in place of desk phones, we would definitely want to manage those phones as well, um, because it would be a loss to the city for someone to bring back a cell phone that we can't unlock and we can no longer use. Um, with that, that is uh, approximately $45 a year, which really only comes out to $4 in some sense a, a month. But um, 
that would that, that would add on to the the cost of issuing a cell phone in place of a desk phone um, to the employees. There are two other things I did want to mention too. Um, with the desk phones, um, we do also have what's called a Verizon One Talk app. So if somebody has a city issued cell phone, if somebody has their own personal cell phone, by having that app on their phone, they can make and receive business calls through that app. Therefore, it camouflages, say, their own personal cell phone number. So for instance, if I'm carrying, like, I don't receive a stipend, I don't have a city issued cell phone, I use my own personal phone, I use the OneTalk app on my phone, so, Jen, are you in the office today? No, I'm actually on vacation, but I'm just <laughs> calling you from <laughs> through the cell phone. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, just to let you know, there is that um, extra feature that we didn't have with the previous phones as well. It's kind of a neat feature. Explains why my phone um, You did ask also if city employees were aware that their city issued cell phones may be discoverable under Public Information Act requests. And so when cities are issued, well, actually, I think this is even for, well, hang on a sec here. Uh, oh, this says even cell phone allowance. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so it does say. Um, in the HR policy for the cell phone policy, it does say an employee who receives a cell phone allowance shall be aware that voice calls, data, metadata, emails, texts, and any other applicable forms of communication to conduct official city business may be deemed to be public records subject to disclosure under the Public Information Act and are subject to discovery and oversight, oversight slash management from the Department of Information Technology if city email is linked to the device. It's the same as if you were issued a city issued yeah. laptop, iPad, and then if yeah. you were issued a city issued yeah. cell phone, yeah. the same um, stipulation yeah. would, and yeah, I, I would did, be. I did specify that was the part that uh, on anyone who receives a cell phone allowance, the paragraph right before that, anyone who receives a city issued cell phone. So okay. same information. Okay. So it's it's whether you get a stipend or a city issued cell phone. Yeah, I think this is a uh, this is good furthering furtherance from our uh, budget conversation. I think it's good to keep bringing this up every so often. Just mm -hmm. well, not, but just to to kind of see where we are again mm -hmm. as technology improves, as we become more advanced as a city. Kind of assess, can, do we have any cost saving measures, especially uh, with some of the duplication with uh, some of our employees who have both a city to shoot cell phone and a desk phone. I mean, that was the tune of I think 47 and then some of them have both I think maybe again if it depends on what the measures are if there's any savings in that I think that would be something we can entertain in the, in the future yeah it possibly, possibly I think yeah. that's a uh, becomes a philosophical uh, discussion yeah, yeah. Uh, what you wouldn't have there is the opportunity for somebody to use say an extension and just contact some you know contact somebody via their extension uh, but yeah it really dives into that yeah. philosophical discussion but yeah. um, if ever you need more data I'm happy to pull it Please. if you want to have a further discussion on yeah. it as well council any other questions or comments on that Good. Seeing no public comments, we thank you for providing this information to us, and uh, we'll keep it cursory for now. And then uh, maybe at some point we'll we'll say we're switching, or we're doing this, or we're doing that. So thank you all for providing the data and, and for explaining this further. We okay. appreciate it. Very good. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, move to our lot ten subrecipient agreement um, discussion, and we'll bring forward uh, our the developer, Nick Simpson. I need to. Good evening, Mr. Simpson. Good afternoon. It's been a little while since I've been in front of you. I wanted to compliment Unity Square mm -hmm. and the long-term thinking that I think the city had putting that in. I have a unique perspective of looking at it uh, from the top of the Ross, and I see nothing but kids and families and members of our community uh, enjoying themselves, and the big events really attract a great place. So, you know, I, I just think it's a 
it, you know, it should be applauded the, the work you guys did on, Absolutely. on doing that. Thank you. So Mr. Simpson, we, uh, this conversation brought up from our last um, uh, session uh, where we were talking about lot, lot 10, but you weren't here. The discussion was kind of going forward. So I think we want to kind of bring this back, uh, come, come up to speed um, with any discussions that you and the mayor have had, bring council in on, on this about uh, kind of your budget, the, the conversation with the, the grant that is here, and, and just we all get on the same page. So wherever you want to start from, I think will be good. Uh, get council up to speed and just make sure we're all here to answer some questions and then uh, the, the goal is to end with uh, with us fine-tuning the subrecipient agreement and, and the details for that. So uh, we'll start here, we'll end there, and, and, and now turn it over to you now. Uh, yeah, so I think I think it would be great to start with going through the sequence of, sequence of events that took place before we got here. So we'll take it all the way back to when uh, the city of Salisbury deemed lot 10 to be a surplus lot, and that happened on November 14, 2016. Mm -hmm. Since then, three separate requests for proposals went out to the public between 2016 and 2021. Multiple proposals were evaluated, and three separate proposals were accepted. The first two RFP recipients had their applications rescinded, though, because they had not made any movement on their promised developments. On August 10th, 2021, in partnership with KLNB Commercial Real Estate Services, the city published the third request for proposal for the land. On September 9th, 2021, Mentis Capital submitted our proposal and through the evaluation process, Mentis Capital's proposal, proposed development was determined to have the best value to the city. It is important to remember that there were three bidders on the parking lot during this RFP, one of which withdrew before the process uh, was complete, and a third group who offered $500,000 for the land. While their offer was indeed more than what Mentis Capital paid, it is important to remember that this group had previously been selected in round one of the RFPs, and they had their proposal rescinded because they had not taken steps to move forward on their promised development. Therefore, their previous track record substantially discounted the seriousness of their offer. On February 9th of 2023, the city approved resolution 3212 and a contract of sale to Mentis Lot 10 and defined the, propose, uh, the purpose of the redevelopment as, quote, multifamily, apartment housing, office space, hotels, restaurants, ground level retail, stormwater management facilities, parking structures, or code co other code compliant uses, or a combination of the aforementioned development types. A little over a month later, on March 28, 2023, the property was officially purchased by Mentis Lot 10. Several months later, in June of 2023, the state of Maryland officially approved grant funding for the design and infrastructure of all phases of the redevelopment plans of 111 Poplar Hill Avenue, Lot 10, and phase one of the development would include a 110-room hotel conference center and rooftop restaurant. Subsequent phases of the development would include additional housing units, ground-level retail, and other space. Later that year, on November 23, 2023, the first reading of Ordinance Number 2839 for accepting the $4 million of funding for Lot 10 mm -hmm. infrastructure improvements was approved in front of Mayor Jack Heath and the City Council. In a subsequent meeting on December 5th, 2023, several weeks later, the second reading of the ordinance, number 2839, for accepting the $4 million of funding for Lot 10 infrastructure improvements was again approved and signed by Mayor Randy Taylor and the City Council. Ordinance number 2839 clearly states, quote, 
whereas no expenditures of the aforementioned grant funding will be permitted until all conditions of the pre-awarded process are met, such as a fully executed subrecipient agreement. With Mentis Lot 10, who is the subrecipient of the funding and the owner of Lot 10. As I've clearly laid out, we've taken a lot of necessary steps and legal steps in public forums to move forward with the purchase of the property and the development. Furthermore, we have worked with local and state legislators to successfully get approved for $4 million of state funding to act as a continued economic, or economic driver for the city and a catalyst for downtown redevelopment. This is good news. And that hard work earned money that citizens of Salisbury have paid in taxes is coming back home and going to work in their backyard. Now it has become clear to me through email correspondence with the mayor last week and from feedback I've received in previous meetings that the definition of the where the money is to be spent is a little unclear because of the title of the funding says infrastructure improvements. <coughs> Eligible project expenditures provided by the Department of General Services fortunately define exactly what those improvements should be. Mm -hmm. The Department of General Services, for which I have a copy that everybody can have, says that grant funding of infrastructure mm -hmm. improvements can go towards acquiring land interest, preliminary design, project design, preparing plans, specifications, related contract documents, preparing site plans, floor plans, specifications for architectural, structural, site improvements, civil, mechanical, electrical work, and related contract documents, construction phase, basic, en basic engineering, inspection and testing services, and post-construction startup services. Examples of a construction project are erecting, installing, or assembling a new structure. Installing, expending, or replacing utility systems. Installing fixed equipment that becomes part of the structure and developing improvements on the site. Furthermore, the construction projects are categorized and number eight and nine are, pertain directly to this site. Site development and improvements mm -hmm. include grading, installing drainage facilities, constructing new roads, walks, parks, retaining walls, retention areas, Fences, standard and essential landscaping and outdoor lighting. Utilities includes installing and extending or replacing items such as sewer, water, and electrical service systems, power plant facilities, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, elevators, fire escapes, sprinklers, and fire alarms, tele telephone communications, and associated control systems. In reviewing that with our project, that is in excess of $10 million, at least, mm -hmm. on phase one. I'd also like to point out that the ordinance number 2839, the one that we have discussed previously, was passed by the city council and the mayor and clearly states the Department of General Services, from which I was just reading, mm -hmm. has awarded the city $4 million in grant funds for infrastructure improvements and that Lot 10 would require significant infrastructure improvements to accommodate the redevelopment plan that the subrecipient of the funding is Mentis Lot 10. I say all this to say, I, want, I, I say all this because I wanted to define the groundwork of how we got here. We did not spend $750,000 on accident. We did it in good faith because the city has accepted legal binding resolutions in public contracts of sale and ordinances for this project. We can no longer accept a shifting goalpost and formally request that the mayor and city council move forward with the subrecipient agreement to fund the infrastructure improvements as defined by the Department of General Services who is funding the money for lot 10. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, because uh, that, uh, I was there for a portion of that, but I wasn't in council or on council for uh, the beginning stages. So thank you for kind of laying the groundwork there. Um, I guess I'll pivot to administration, seeing that, and I know we've had some discussion yeah. on the, the definitions and those things, and I've, I've had a chance to review this as well. What are your thoughts seeing 
these things and, and the, the funding and information for the yeah. award letter? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, when I took over in November as mayor, I, I dug into this and, um, you know, Andy and I have been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on this topic. And I not just spent days, I sent weeks tracking down the defined purpose of this grant. So, um, the Eardra Bell who signed this, I have a direct email that has very specific questions answered what it can be funded, what can be funded. I'm not saying that there isn't PAYGRO grants that can fund various items that you mentioned. But that was where the confusion lied for me. So I dug into it with Deirdre. I called, I think Carl's in the room, I called Carl, asked him to, to get way in on it. Spoke to Lewis Luna with DGS, which is where the origin of this grant. Went through a line and line and detailed line line item, line item, and I have a very specific range of things we can do. Two things: one, design for infrastructure and infrastructure capital specifically. And I think that's been the debate from the beginning. And I don't think that I think that really the more the the problem is is that I think that the folks within the circle may have not realized that that was specific to that. If somebody knows something better than that, I'd, I'd like to hear it. But I asked. I asked that question and let it sit out there for weeks to say, hey, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm not doing this because I don't want a hotel and conference center coming to our city. Don't, for a minute, you know. So I've been downtown for 30 years. I've owned a building down there. It certainly would benefit us all to have not only the city, but the downtown. I mean, that's not even an issue. I'm just trying to stay on the right side of the grant and the way it was intended. Uh, I'm not saying that there weren't people that said to you that there were some things that we could do outside of that preference. I'm just saying that's what I'm bound to do. And, you know, um, so don't misunderstand. We've, I think we've got a friendly relationship. I've been frustrated. We've been frustrated with each other. It isn't because I don't want a hotel and conference center. And, you know, um, I get responses from people that are in favor of this saying things like, um, don't micromanage it. You know, I'm like, I, I'm not sure what that looks like. I mean, as, a, as an admin, you know, a, a person heading up the administration, I have to micromanage it. I have to do it the right way from my perspective. So, and what gather information I've gathered. So, you want to add it to that? So, I guess my, and, and thank you for yeah. uh, kind of going, going within that, but. I think what we're my my more narrow question is yeah. so we've we've spent some time which again respected respected of that and, and myself I've done some research too we spent time figuring out again the the grant that was awarded City of Salisbury infrastructure improvements and then furthermore again from the house bill construction costs and architect engineering fees so giving that and then we go down to the the actual definition of architectural and engineering services and construction. So I guess that's where it, we, we, I don't think there's more, I mean, I think the, the, pay, the writing is right here from the state, from Department of General Services. And I mean, I've had conversations myself mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, Ms. Bell and, and with, uh, with the different persons ab above her, and this is what they come to. So I guess m my question what, is- What are you looking at? The, uh, so Appendix A. So, and then if you pair it with the actual application and award letter signed by Ms. Deidre Bell. Mm -hmm. So the award letter seems name of PAYGO funded project, City of Salisbury Infrastructure Improvements, by way of, if you flip the page, Lot 10 Redevelopment, House Bill 200, gives a description of it, design and improve infrastructure for all phases, of redevelopment plans for 111 Poplar Hill. And then that next page, page two of two, says this state funding, and then this is for the $3 million and the $1 million, construction costs. Well, what you're looking at is the application that we no, need. No, 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 so this is actual, the actual award letter. So this is, this is with the award okay. letter, and right here, so this state funding where it says A, construction costs, mm -hmm. right? And then, that's, Are you in the, in the $3 million packet? Yes. Yeah. Yep, right there. Yep. You're talking about two of two. Four letters? You're talking about two of two? Yes. So again, when this was so in the in the general information, information form, with the award, they uh, it was detailed well, that... That was the application that was done after the reward was made. Am I wrong? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. it was... That wasn't that wasn't a part of the uh, the grant application. That's the that's the application that after it was awarded, 
that they wanted to, to, that's how they wanted to fund it. Am I wrong? That's right. So this has nothing to do with the application itself. This has to do with the actual funding, though. Well, we could have put a you know five hundred thousand dollars for the boat in, a boat in there if we wanted to. It doesn't have to do with the state's in indication of use of funds. I'm just saying. In other words, that was done after the award was made. After you gave us your budget, it, go ahead, Andy. He he completed the form and that was sent over. But that doesn't so, mean that's so what fundable. I'm is, yes. So this is saying that the, these monies is to be used for these Explain these it. items here. And this is this is detailing that, and this is from the state, saying that these are applicable expenditures for these these monies. Yeah, yes, the three million dollar breakdown and what you're just reading shows you the buckets that we applied for and, and broke down, um, and then this is the award letter that a uh, funding award letter that goes with that, and then we have a so, similar one to to the one million dollars where. Uh, so the general information form to receive funding f back from DJS, you have to submit the form letter, which is this, plus then right. request for funding. Those two documents are in here. So the state so this gave is what us we money. asked for, and this is the state gave us money based off of this is what we submitted. Mm -hmm. Is it true? No, I was done after the fact. Mm -hmm. We our request for funding came based off for after we submitted these. The award um, that was granted to us last summer was based not off of these applications, but were based off of conversations with legislators. And then this is the detail of it, but it's not, so this is an app, after it was awarded, this is asking for reimbursement. You had to submit these general, general forms. So this is so that's not from the state, not saying they're, they're going to fund it in this way. It was a function of the budget, which is where we've been struggling from the whole time. He gave us a budget, which when I looked at it, I was like, wait a minute, this isn't infrastructure. This isn't designed for infrastructure. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here that's not a part of that, which started the whole conversation. And, and I think what you're looking at is that, is that that's as if we made that application to the state. That was not the way it was done. That was in reverse. But what I'm saying is, and again, this is going from House Bill 200, where they gave the money to the city of Salisbury for infrastructure improvements for this lot 10. And again, this is what we, we gave to them. Yeah. When they gave the money to the mayor and city council of Salisbury, mm -hmm. this, the state has this and are aware of this document, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, yes but, but so, it, okay. No, I'm just, so I'm, I'm not looking, I'm just, what I'm looking to is, is kind of fine tune again if, if the state has this mm -hmm. what, what is should we give them another one or what so what I, what I want is what's the next the next step well that's the point of the sub recipient agreement maybe Ashley can chime in on this well no because Ashley's just going to do she's going to she's waiting for direction from you I know, I know. So that's what I well, think that's what we're that's what we're having this discussion well, here today this whole conversation is an administrative discussion not not a legislative one and so I'm doing this for the purposes of transparency to the public but at the end of the day, what I'm saying is what he's requested in his budget relative to the grant application yeah. are two different things. That application, with those numbers you see on that page, wasn't generated when the PAYGO grant was awarded. They were, that, that was the first round of, hey, this is what we, we were justifying our rate, our, 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 our reimbursement for. But that's independent of the sub-recipient agreement. When I looked at it, I went, wait a minute. Wait a minute, it doesn't have anything to do with... Do you have, so given these funds, and you just said $10 million, but you, so given the $4 million that was awarded to the city on, on your behalf, you are agreeing with these figures here for the construction costs and architect engineering fees for this here? Having the full definition from the state, because it doesn't matter what I think is infrastructure and development or what anybody else thinks, mm -hmm. it's what the state thinks because it's their money. And it's the site development and improvements and gr for grading, mm -hmm. installing drainage facilities, construction of new roads, walks, parkings, retainage walls, re recreation areas, fences, standard and essential landscaping, and outdoor lighting. Utilities include extending or replacing new items such as water, sewer, electrical surfaces, power plant facilities, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, elevators, fire escapes, sprinklers, fire alarms, and telephone communication. That's all going to happen on the site. You not can give us of the site. right, and this this is going to this. And you can give us if we set milestones for you. You can show Easily. that these funds are being used for those purposes. In fact, we've already agreed that we would mm -hmm. fund it ourselves and, and then be reimbursed. reimbursed. Listen, and, uh, and then we also have this ordinance stating that we are the recipient of this funding accepted by you and the council. I'm going to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. council already approved this project to happen. And this is where I'm not, I mean, again, this was decided, again, partly before us and then with us. We all on this council 
agree to the, what was the date? The, uh, on November 14th of, no, I'm sorry, 12-5-23 was the second reading where we actually accepted a four million for this project. And I don't, I just, I'm, I'm, I think we've done our research. We've, we've, we've done, it. We, we're at a standstill. And fr so, and I, I mean, just speaking with, at MML this past weekend, Frederick's on the same thing and they, they were in law for years with this. And again, what's gonna happen is the further we continue to go away, the more costs are gonna increase. And we have an opportunity to bring a grade A hotel and convention center here. Again, people are passing by Salisbury, going to Ocean City and other places. We can, because right now it's just a lot that we can't even, we don't even own right now. Okay. Yes, so I just wanna remind the administration that the ordinances and resolutions and any legislation come to council. And we've approved yeah. each step of the way. I agree with that part. So it's a balanced piece. It's not just right. an administration conversation. Listen, I, I don't... We've, oh, but okay. Mayor Taylor, please allow me to speak. I think to avoid this circular conversation is we need to decide how we're moving forward with this, I think. That's how I see it. And that's where I, again, I go back to for you yourself, you agree to these measures right here for the uh, construction costs mm -hmm. and architect slash engineering fees. Those were for the for the three million dollars, and then subsequently for the one million dollars. Yeah, and then looking at the state's <laughs> definition, I think for any avoidance of doubt, we would just make sure that we remove any type of like like uh, interior design service. It just no. like, make sure that's very clearly separate. No. Mm -hmm. Only on infrastructure related items as I've read now twice yeah. of exactly that. Like that's my, that we're trying well, to be my, transparent. The de yeah, that's great. The definition as I understand it from D.A. Bruckner Bell, who we went again in detail about this was, we're not water, sewer, sidewalks, lighting, perhaps, not, not anything to do with on the site. And that's where I'm challenged. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I don't understand why um, this is a difficult idea. I mean, it's just, it's infrastructure. And, and at this point I, that I'm aware of, at this point, you haven't submitted a site plan to even the city to even find out what the existing conditions are. are. And all I've gotten from you are budgets that are outside of the infrastructure bucket. That's why I'm frustrated. And, and you know, to your point, I agree. You voted on the on the acceptance of the grant and the grant. I totally realize that. But it's at this point, the administration's role to to enter into the agreement, the subrecipient agreement with the developer, which we're trying to do and want to do. But we have to do it properly. I don't think that's a difficult are idea. Using the the Department of General Services definition of architect and engineering services and construction work as defined by them at, by the take are we going to use yeah. that in our sub recipient agreement because it is very easy my forward with this mm -hmm. this is the whole challenge of the getting I'm not saying there's not paygo grants that can't fund those things I'm just saying to you that this grant was given to us for the purposes of infrastructure as defined by the state not, on this end. that's not defined that way yeah. it, oh, can I say something please sure. yes as I can remember, when this first took place, and I'm going to be very honest about it, the money was given for just that project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not. Well, that's that what money the, was that's what allocated ordinance just for that says. project. And I do remember it. And I did fight because I was actually kind of perturbed because of how our parking lots got sold. The parking lot is sold. The money, as I can remember, and if I can remember, it was in, Michelle, help me remember when we had that ESAM meeting. It's been like maybe four years ago. Something like that. It, three. It doesn't, that's why I know. And I remember this coming up. And that money was specifically for what I'm understanding was allocated just for that. Thank you, Councilwoman. Okay. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Thank you. Miss um, uh, Boucher, just one question. So again, the lot, uh, the subrecipient agreement. What other, what pieces uh, are you waiting for to, to finalize the subrecipient agreement? In our discussions with the administration, I think we were looking for some type of deliverables that Mr. Simpson could provide to us. And then, as he mentioned, he's not looking for us just to funnel the money through him. It, he would have to prove he did something and submit a request for reimbursement, and then the city would grant that. So I think the holdup from at least 
legal standpoint is input on what those deliverables would be. Um, and we have some thoughts on that, I think, that Mr. Simpson has shared with us. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, if you look at appendix, appendix A, you know, they've got every top potential expenditure you could come to. But the closing line in the, in the intro says, consult with DGS before committing to any cost. And there's a reason they put that in there, so that it's used properly. And I guess what I'm saying is, if you want to come to my office anytime, you want to get on the phone with Deidre Bell, with DGS, and we walk her through this, and you can be convinced that, that what you're submitting is an appropriate form of infrastructure, I'll be happy to go along with you. I'm just trying to stay out of jail. You know? You know, so at the end of the day, I don't want to be administering a grant inappropriately. I don't think that's too I think much. That's, to, that's a ludicrous. Uh, well, I mean, I think. Listen, I we think use proper funding in property. And is this that, her signature? Not, oh, so is it this her signature? I just want to. What I'm saying is, I think it, it, it's not ludicrous. Well, I just, I mean, you're not even going to allot the money if it's not uh, um, correctly appropriated. Yeah. The you state said it again, will give you that money. The state actually will not give you that money until the project or until they actually know what's going on and how it's being done and who's doing it. Then they allot the money to whoever the construction, the developers or whatever are doing whatever they're doing. I mean, because I'm going through that right now with a, um, a, and a grant, with a grant, and that's just how they're allotting it. They're allotting it to the people who are doing the renovations and everything. It doesn't come to actually not supposed to come to the actually organization it goes to the um business people who are doing the work like i, like I said my, my offer's out there if you want to come by the office and we'll get on the phone with deirdre bell be happy to do that happy to do that All right, so we'll, i'm just telling you that's where i am and i've been that place for a long time several months so i don't have the ability to dictate that conversation i'm not sure how to proceed i mean i'm happy to you know, proceed in whichever way is is feasible quickly, because you know this has been going on for yeah. a long time, and I, we literally, in our opinion, these are legally binding statements from the city saying that we're moving forward, and we are paying tax dollars and insurance and all of the other costs on an on a monthly basis. It, it, it's not sustainable. So, so we'll yeah. pivot to just a public comment. Just to, I want okay. I want to keep this you know conversation mm -hmm. long. So we'll start with uh, Zach Evans. And again, each person has three minutes for comment. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Zach Evans. I'm here on behalf of the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce as the active um, board of directors chairman. Uh, I come tonight just sharing um, some some thoughts and, and some opinions representative of our 662 uh, business members ranging from small indiv independently owned businesses to large scale corporations that employ thousands of people here on Delmarva. So um, we would just like to encourage uh, the administration, the council and the subrecipient to find some kind of uh, resolution on behalf of the business community. We recognize the hotel conference center would provide an entirely new um, economic engine here in the city, which I think we've heard mentioned already by both, by all sides, by all three parties. Um, this would mean significant job creation during the construction phase, but also significant hospitality jobs created to service the property. Hospitality jobs and service-oriented jobs provide entry-level opportunities for people with real career growth. Um, we see that in our respective resort and beach communities here locally, and we know that we could have those same opportunities for young people or people who are looking for a career change or who have just received um, education in those respective fields. Uh, we also just want to recognize, um, which there's been a lot of discussion, so I think we all have the details in the timeline, but um, for all intents and purposes, this grant was specifically uh, identified and earmarked for this project. So um, we as a business community just feel strongly that uh, we don't want to risk repurposing or misutilizing the funds or misappropriating the funds in any way that would jeopardize this potential um, investment from the state into our community. And, uh, and then finally, you know, Projects similar to this and some of the other downtown revitalization and development we've seen over the years, um, they expand our commercial tax base, they add jobs, and they push new customers into the doors of the businesses that already exist um, in our city. So this is part of a sustainability and a retention plan for the existing 662 businesses that we represent as well. Uh, just wanted to share that on behalf of our board, and I'll close my comments there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Taylor. Oh, 
Good evening, Robert Taylor, a longtime Salisbury resident. Uh, and I think this is the first time I've seen a mayor that really digs into things. And I think we all need to congratulate and thank Mayor Taylor, we're not related incidentally, uh, for what he's been doing on this project. Uh, because somebody needs to drill down to it and get down to the bottom of it. Uh, I'm not going to take very long. I grew up on a farm. I watched hogs at a trough. Now as an adult, I get to see a lot of people feeding at the public trough. And frankly, it is sickening. And I've seen another example of it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Carl Newton. Uh, Delegate Newton, sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. So uh, I'm the author of House Bill 200. Uh, you know, we worked for years to secure this $4 million in, in state funding for this project uh, with two governors, uh, three, three or four mayors. I don't know. Y'all had a flurry of mayors there for a minute. <laughs> uh, several, several councils and this developer uh, to secure this funding. It was not easy, especially post-COVID you know, with the way finances are to, to secure $4 million at one time in the governor's discretionary funds in the state budget. That money is divvied up statewide quickly. And for us to grab $4 million in one year um, was not easy, but we were able to do it. You know, uh, Governor Hogan and Governor Moore both saw this project as something feasible and very viable for Salisbury and uh, something that they felt was needed. So I'm not here to talk about the merits of the project. That's already been discussed time and time and time again. I just want to talk about the funding and make sure that that funding is utilized where it's directed by the way of that legislation and the supporting documents in the state budget. Uh, whether or not you deem $4 million worth of infrastructure, fiber, sewers, whatever you deem for that, that particular project, if you don't think it's $4 million worth, that's fine. But that money is not to be used elsewhere. Okay, I want to be clear about that. Okay, what we're dealing with now is the trust of the state government, especially in a time where we have budget tightness, I guess is a fair word to use to make sure that uh, money is to be utilized where it is supposed to be and not somewhere else. It's not a slush fund where you can take, you know, two million here and 500,000 there and cut somebody's grass and plant shrub somewhere you, that's not what it's for and once you start doing that mm -hmm. then when you come back asking for other funding you're going to be at the bottom of the list because they're going to lose trust when those state dollars are allocated your tax dollars my tax dollars are allocated they're allocated for a specific purpose and everything that's lined with within that everything that this man has said about dgs and those uh applicable uses are is accurate um i've been saying that for a year now but nobody seems to listen. That's okay. My wife doesn't listen to me either. It's all good. Uh, but I just wanted to be clear that if there was a thought, I have, you know, you always hear rumors, you know how Salisbury is, everybody's talking to Food Line and Acme, you know, that, okay, we're going to we're gonna fund two million here and take two million to fill a hole somewhere else or, mm -hmm. or do this, that, and the other. That should not be happening because you are risking a serious issue in future budgets because where money's not trusted is where money's not spent. So I just wanted to be clear and double, triple, quadruple down on that because it's very hard to secure state funding. And we've done very well at that. I think just about everything the city has asked of me over the past decade, they've gotten. And I know next they, they're looking for funding for the zoo and some other projects. And I'd like to see those funded and fulfilled. But if we go start taking money and using it elsewhere, outside of the scope of its intent, you're going to cause mistrust in Annapolis, and that's going to not bode well for any of us. So I just wanted to be clear. I wanted to come by here tonight and just be clear that this $4 million is supposed to be used for that address on Poplar, Ave Poplar Hill, and only that address, not my address, your address, your address, maybe yours, uh, but not anywhere else other than that. So I just wanted to be clear, you know, as a delegation, we have a great delegation representing this county. We work very hard to get things done. And I don't want 
I already fight with one hand tied behind my back. I don't want to fight with two because then there'll be said, well, you know, Salisbury, they just do what they want with them. Like, we, we don't want to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've had, I've had the AG's office reach out, DGS has reached out, trying to figure out if we're not going to use this money properly, if they can recoup the money back. So that way you can't use it improperly. But I just wanted to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do, that, that that trust is kept. I don't want to lose that trust with the state. So, and Mayor, if you have any questions, we can talk anytime mm -hmm. about this. I want to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I so, all right. He delegate. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Joe Venosa. You want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to well, comment. Oh, I think you, you direct. I don't want to comment on I, public comment. Yeah, just, yeah, just the, give me. The president oh. comments. <laughs> he relates. What, what were you saying? He relates to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's inconsistent with what I got from DGS. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you and, and I, and I, see how it goes next year. okay, I'm just asking, I'm just saying to you, that's just inconsistent. All right, I'm in the room. I'm in the arena. Okay, now, I understand. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Hey. Right. So. Okay. I, I got it, Deshaun. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Venosa, Salisbury. Mm -hmm. Man, do I miss Norm Conway. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, you and me both. So I just watched about an hour ago our county executive basically <laughs> willingly give away more or less about a million dollars of our county budget through the hybridization of the uh, dispensary. and. That's going to remain to be seen as far as its long-term problems. But that was done in a very untransparent manner. The uh, task force was not advertised to the public. There are numerous critiques of that, even from the council itself. Mr. Venosa, I want to make sure we're going. Yeah, I am. I, I, okay. I, thank you, sir. Thank I have the you. Floor. Thank you very much. Related to that thank you. is the fact that we're seeing a similar process uh, that only now has come to light uh, in that we finally have the developer here to ideally address these issues. Um, I admire, and again, I disagree with Mayor Taylor politically on almost everything, but I have to give him credit on this one for at least trying to make sure that the agreement is what it says it is. So I would hope that the developer would take him up on that in calling DGS to actually confirm that. Ultimately, I'm blown away at watching in public the city finally care about something when certain moneyed interests are involved. I can't seem to get the city to care much about a lot of our neighborhoods, it seems. We have huge financial and cultural and racial and economic issues, but man, when a developer complains, the tap dancing begins. It's it's really stunning, and, and I'm glad if people watch this on Pack 14, they see it, because it is just, to piggyback off to Mr. Taylor, it's it's really disgusting. So, congratulations. Carolyn Wogelmuth. My name is Carolyn Wolgamuth. I'm a city resident. For starters, when I looked at the agenda, the item that I'm talking about now was on there as administrative and council discussion. There was nothing, no mention of a developer being here. I don't know who invited the developer here. I assume the city council president did. I want to make sure you get your full three minutes. Pardon me? I want to make sure you get your full three minutes. Anyway, this is deja vu. The developer has brought, been brought in again to spar with the mayor. And certain members of the city council are standing with the developer and pushing, bullying the mayor to agree to what they want. We have other people coming in and speaking, saying that the money was earmarked specifically for Lot 10. Well, the award letter didn't say Lot 10. It said for infrastructure improvements in the city of Salisbury. Now, you may have wanted it to be for Lot 10, and maybe that piece of paper that was submitted after the grant award by Mr. Kitzrow. Maybe that designated Lot 10, but we don't see anything about Lot 10. The public has yet to see a request for the funds. We never saw the application. 
The only thing we've seen as far as an award says infrastructure improvements. So, you know, I just don't understand. The last time um, the developer was here, he said he couldn't do this without the whole $4 million grant. But here he is again, so I guess he can still do it. I don't know. Mayor Taylor, I want to applaud you for taking the time to delve into this issue and earnestly trying to resolve this grant funding with the interests of city residents at the forefront, not the developer. And to those city council members who continue to press developer wants over residents' infrastructure needs, I question whose interests you're promoting and why. In effect, your ethics are on full display here. Thank you. Mike Dunn. Mr. President, members of the council, good evening. Mayor, good evening. Um, wow. Just sitting here, it's quite been quite a while just uh, to listen to all of this. I'm going to talk about some economic development numbers with you. I had a conversation with Justin Polizzi, who is the um, tourism manager for Wacomico County. In each and every year, through two wrestling tournaments, the softball tournament is about to come here, and the governor's challenge. There are 2,600 wrestlers who come here. There are 5,210 softball players who come here. There are 2,000 basketball players, 122 teams who come to the Governor's Cup Challenge at Christmas. It's the largest basketball tournament in the country, the largest holiday high school basketball tournament in the country. In 2013, 54% of the participants that I just rattled off stayed in Wicomico County hotels. Again, 54%. In 2023, only 28% of those participants are staying in Wicomico County. They're now staying in hotels in other communities. That's courtesy of the Wicomico Rec and Parks and Tourism Department. So 1,400 of 50, 1,458 of 5,200 softball players who will be coming here in just a few weeks, they're going to be staying here. If 700 more of them were to stay here at $150 a night, that would be $105,000 in revenue at the hotels alone. Salisbury University had conversation with them, with Eli Modlin, the chief of staff at SU. Salisbury University is losing out on NCAA playoff tournament um, bids each and every year. That's between four and eight teams with 25 team members plus coaches and staff and an average of four family and friends who come to watch their athletes play. That's 200 team members times four people. That's 800 people looking to stay and eat and visit in Salisbury and Wicomico County over one weekend. They don't come here because the NCAA does not award Salisbury University has the best athletic facilities in Division Three. They don't award the playoff tournaments here because we have inadequate hotel space. Frederick, Maryland, as was mentioned, is going through this identical situation. They, however, have received seven and a half million dollars. How in the world can Salisbury say no to something that Frederick is saying yes to? Um, and I will just say again, I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Salisbury Committee. Um, we have about 115 members. Um, it's important to remember that the Ross, mm -hmm. built by, I know, built by Mr. Simpson, will be 95% occupied by Salisbury University students this August. So congratulations. Can we, can we and thank the you. Time to members of the council, <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
I will. Uh, well, well. Just to keep everyone straight, Council President has can authorize in in meetings in past. I have given well enough time to to members who are sitting here in in our audience right now. I have given time over and over again. Mayor, I would ask that you please don't interrupt. Lynn Bratton. Please. Good evening. My name is Lynn Bratton. Many of you know me. I was a guidance counselor or a teacher for a number of you in the room uh, many years ago. And I am just a concerned citizen. I live in Salisbury. I'm also an ex-guidance counselor, and I, I look at, and I've had conflict resolution training out the wazoo, and I look at this as an issue of every side sees their own issues, and they all see their own truths. I'm absolutely thrilled that we have an executive branch that is willing to delve into the weeds and the details of agreements to, yes, keep them out of legal trouble. I don't believe jail time was in, implied, but I do think there is a legal binding contract that when our mayor signs something, he's putting his reputation, his signature, his good name, and also the faith and good nature of all of our citizens on the line. And he has a legal fiduciary right to do it right. I absolutely do not have an argument at all with any of the absolutely amazing plans of having a hotel. And thank you so much, Mr. Dunn. I'm the reason we had one of those, a lot of those wrestling tournaments. You may not have known that in the past. But I'm the reason we had 30,000 wrestlers here. And it was hard pressed for me to even get a press release from anybody. And one of the years I even got the Tourism Person of the Year Award for bringing so many new faces into our community and having them stay in our hotels. So thank you for acknowledging the wrestling community instead of just all the other, I mean, I was a wrestling mom forever. <laughs> so um, we have to do it right. There are rules, there are laws, there are documents, there are legal ramifications. All I think we as citizens want is for the money to get spent the way the law says it is supposed to be spent. And the law does indicate that it's just for, your, for that particular lot. Nobody's arguing that. Nobody's arguing that, we, that you plan to put a hotel. Nobody's arguing that it would be a good economic driver. Nobody is arguing that you could probably fill it. We're simply saying, let's just make sure that according to all people understandings, it's not being used for something that's against the rules. That's all I think we're all saying. And we've been going at this for months. So we all, adult men, women, get on a conflict resolution conference call and just figure out exactly what is and what isn't. If it isn't, say, well, okay, I'll spend it here then. And don't keep, your, you know, just, just let's get this done and let's do it right. That's all I'm asking, folks. We've spent enough time on it, all of us. Thank you. Thank you and I didn't go over my three minutes, did I? You, if you wanted to, I would. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ms. Bratton. Any other public comments? I, anybody online? I don't think so. I know most of the people here. I don't have anything. Thank you. I think Ms. Bratton underscored it well, and then that was the reason for bringing it here. It wasn't to, uh, it was because, again, we were discussing it last time. I felt like both parties should be here. We all get on one accord. There's there's no, I mean, that's 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 just the reason why that we brought this here today. Get all the questions answered. And like I said from at the beginning of this portion, my goal was at the end now to come at a resolution for um, uh, the sub receiving agreement and it still sounds like there's some question there go ahead I, I, I just want to underscore so the the draft of the sub recipient agreement that quasi exists there is an exhibit that's addressed in there that details and more definition the budget so based off of the budget it is a reimbursement schedule that would happen based off of those terms and conditions. It is imperative that we come to a consensus on those pieces because if there's an assumption that something will be funded and it is not funded appropriately, the money has been spent, the reimbursement is not coming. So we was, like that is, I think, why it has taken some time because we are working through that process. But since it is a reimbursement grant, I want to make sure that the developer fully aware is that 
it needs to make sure that it meets the guidelines that are outlined because it is a reimbursement. The money will come after that um, expense has been incurred by the developer. So, and I think we go back to the first, and again, uh, when this was in, from December, how much time is needed to to go back and forth in email with DGS, with uh, Director Bell, with Secretary Chart, like how much more time is, is is needed because I've, I mean. I, I would be happy to sit down with him and spend as much time as we need and talk, call Mrs. Bell, call DGS. But, but, you know, one of the things that, and I don't think you're embarrassed me for saying this, but one of the items he threw in there was, you know, I spent 25 years in commercial banking. He, he spent $900,000 for an interest reserve, which I get as a project of that scale, but that's not any, you know, that's not fundable. And I'm just super frustrated because. I, I, I thought this part of my background would be the biggest contributor, and it's becoming difficult that I'm having these basic conversations with what, what I think to be fairly obvious. And and I'm again, I, I'm with John. I mean, with uh, Mike Dunn and everybody else. I want to see the project get built. I think it'd be hugely contributory to the neighbor, to the, the downtown and the city. But we got to do it the right way. Period. And so I think that's all I'm saying. I think yeah, I'm stuck. You know, Carl had an opportunity to kind of put it in writing a year, it was three months ago, four months ago. I asked him to do that, and and so as to what could be funded. That's why I went on this journey to to, and I've spent some time with the delegation trying to get it straight, and I want to get it straight. But I I think I've got it straight. We just got to get a budget that works. And as it's a, fundable. I've spent a good deal amount of my time off. I started from scratch. Okay calling, emailing people, because I wanted to get it right. Again, the same implications that the administration, we also do, do as well, because we approved the sub agreement to go, and fundamentally, it will come back to us for resolution. So I think that it's equally. So I've spent many of hours researching, calling the same people, and I've gotten <laughs> different answers. So that's why I'm confused. And so I think, what hindrance have you all, I mean, when's the last time you all have met? Fortunately, we, we did have good communications last week. I, I think in hearing all of this, and I agree with you, that now that I've seen the ineligible side of it, you know, existing debt, interest, uh, feasibility study, salary, wages to employees of the project, all of those things are like not yeah. deemed, and yeah. that's simple. Yeah. But we have 10, probably $20 million of, of qualified uh, information here that would work for the project. What I think it would be best to do is um, I, I can have my attorneys draft the sub-recipient agreement and we can send it to everybody. The state and copy everybody on it and that way there's a copied form and we can say here is the sub-recipient because I don't want to wait any longer. I'll do it. I'll, I'll write it myself and we'll send it to the state and they can say yes because it, right here it says consult with DGS before con committing to costs. So they'll have to be consulted anyways. We will do it right to the book of what they say and we can move this right along. I'm sure my attorneys can knock it out this week. Hmm. Well, I think we already have an attorney working on it, but we see I, come to I, a, you, you I don't. I don't have. I've been told not to deal with the. I've been told not. I, I'm not getting anything out of the state or the city from for this subsidy agreement. I'm, I can't wait any longer from my side. I, like, if you guys want to provide it to me, if I, if can can I have the subsidy the, the current subsidy agreement as it stands? There is. Mm. Okay, so I'll draft it. I can draft it with my attorneys, no problem, and I will use the city's forms that you guys have used for other developers, and I will use it in that same form, and I can just go right off of what Department of General Services says, and then we can send it to everybody. Yeah, this, okay, do what you want. I, I that, told you, I told you we, work? Have, we could, we could send it to the phone. I don't want to have a, a philosophical conversation. I want not a philosophical have a conversation. I want so to have like thing, a it's very- It's an objective conversation. I think what we'll move to is uh, hearing, do we, do we have consensus from council? to move this forward and we actually resolute us authorizing us being a part of this conversation with the actual subrecipient agreement. So again, that's us being a part of the conversation. We move forward and if need, if need be, we, we actually draft a resolution for us to be able to have the subrecipient agreement with the developer on behalf of the city. I'm good with that. Yes. yes. Well, you're a Bucky, legislative hold, body. It, it, hold on. It's, this is an administrative function. Hold on, please. Period. Hold on, please. You too. You too. Councilwoman Jackson. Excuse me. So we're going to, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, we're, we're, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I understand if you need to be a part of this conversation, but we're, we're council wants to move. For, mm -hmm. I'm saying if we have consensus to move forward to draft a resolution for us to uh, have be a part of the conversation with the actual um, sub-recipient grant agreement. 
and we would have. Let me you don't, clarify. You don't have uh, so our legal department would draft that. It's already a draft. We just need to work with. We, ye, you all, your offices need to work together. Have, the city has a form subrecipient agreement, mm -hmm. which needs to be modified, you know, not tremendously sure. with respect to this project because we use a form subrecipient agreement. The crux of it is, as Mr. Kitzrow mentioned, that exhibit B for the reimbursement schedule. Mm -hmm. That is where we need to reach a consensus on with that exhibit B. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you draft yeah. that? With these, again, we've all seen these paper, this document mm -hmm. here with the with the appendix A, for the actual f uh, f funding mechanisms for eligible funding. You draft that, send it to council for review, and then we'll also send it to DGS for review as well. I can do that if requested. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes, please. That's so. Again, the public will see that. You will see that. We will see that in DGS as well. Yeah, I just want to make sure, it, it sounds like you guys are excited to be part of the process. I want to make sure we are not um, in sidestep as being the compliance officers and the people who also ultimately disperse the reimbursement and, and, and review the work. We need to make sure that we're comfortable, too. That's all. Thank you. I think, again, we, we, uh, we want to get one drafted to review. I guess we're talking in very ambiguous terms. Let's get one drafted, <laughs> then we go from there. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Yeah. All right, we'll move forward to our administration and council comments. We'll pivot to, to you. Oh. I did, do we have a date on that? Uh, when is that going to oh, be done by? Is it? I just want an actual date. How about by the next Friday? Is that so that's fine. For, to, to, the, for our review, yeah, that's fine. Because I would need to discuss with Ms. Miller with procurement, with yes. Mr. Simpson, with administration. So at Great. least I think two weeks would be. Sure. That's I need it. Thank you. Administration. Uh, the only couple things real quick. Um, it is July 1st. So that means uh, June is over. And we had a tremendous June from an events calendar. It was jam-packed. I want to give a shout out to not only our events team, but all of our um, hard workers from our field ops, our public law enforcement, and, and our fire who've had to um, support all of those events. Um, so anybody who had their hands involved, whether it's volunteers or paid staff or just people who came out and enjoyed them, uh, you know, it was a really successful June. Uh, looking forward to the holiday this week. And just hopefully everyone stays safe and come out and see the, the fireworks. Absolutely. Thank you. Mayor? Yeah, happy 4th of July, everybody. I'll be participating in Operation We Care, which will be at the uh, Shortbridge Stadium on Friday night. Or, oh, Thursday night, sorry. Uh, so I wish everybody a happy 4th and uh, enjoy the good weather. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we'll go right down the line. Councilwoman Gregory? Uh, so I want to congratulate Salisbury P Flag on putting on an amazing Pride event. It was such an amazing turnout. It was incredibly hot. Uh, bless all the queens who were out there. I don't know how they did it. It was um, a lot of fun, had a blast. Um, got to give a proclamation on behalf of the city council. That was a lot of fun. Um, the parade was really well attended. So many, it's good to see so many faces, smiling, happy. Um, just overall a great event and I was really pleased to be able to participate in a small way. Um, also, just want to remind folks, with the heat being the way it is, please make sure that um, you're checking on loved ones who may be vulnerable. Um, I'm not sure if there are going to be any uh, um, heat stations or anything like that, but it's supposed to be well into the 90s for the next, at least according to the 10-day forecast. So just please be mindful of, of folks who may be more sensitive and, and look out for them and check in on them. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Jackson, I want to make sure I pivot to you and thank you again for, for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for all the cards, the acknowledgments, the texts, the phone calls, and the get wells. Um, <laughs> it, it was overwhelming. I thank you so much. I'm still not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was before. Um, and I just want to tell people advocate for your health. You are your best advocator. Because if I'd have waited probably any longer, I probably wouldn't be here or wouldn't have been here. Um, I just thank everybody for everything they've done for me. I'm blessed. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Tough. Councilwoman DeShield. I participated in the last mayoral dinner 
Deshaun and I went to Sharptown, <laughs> and we had an amazing speaker give you his name, Sheriff Lewis. So he gave us the update on the new $40 million deputy, this new um, home. And he's thrilled to give anyone a tour. So feel free, I think, um, Chief Mindshine, you've had your tour, right, already? <laughs> anyway, so it's a lovely facility. Um, also, um, I participated, uh, Jordan, as part of uh, in the city, um, an employee of the city, I'm not sure of his um, title, but he runs a uh, think tank, and they have been doing this at ins Inspire each month. And I was happy to participate in that last year because they take input from different organizations and are trying to make it a better place for everyone to feel comfortable and prosper. And I need to welcome my sister who's here from California in the back. <laughs> so thanks, Sally, for coming along. All the way from... California, yes. L.A. <laughs> Hi, sister. <laughs> Council Vice President. Well, it was, it's been a very busy June. Um, Juneteenth was well attended, as long as and Pride was well attended also. That was very good. Well done. The city put that on nice, safe. Every, everybody had a great time at both events. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to our fire department and our police department. Uh, June was a pretty busy month for them. I think the weather has brought a little bit of an uptick in some um, things that our public safety has had to deal with. I really appreciate their professionalism in that. Um, I did have a tour of the Salisbury Police Department recently. Got us chance to speak to a lot of the officers and um, I think there's uh, they're doing a great job I really appreciate all they do there's so much that goes into it so many moving parts uh, I wanted to talk about um, uh, some other things that Salisbury is doing to address things that are going on in our communities. Um, we do have uh, our community parks. There's many improvements going on. We have youth activities not only at Truett, but we have it at Newton Street, um, our Unity Square. It's very busy. You can see when we have the splash pad, especially now, with a lot of families, young children out there. That's beautiful. Um, our housing committee has been meeting, and that is something that we've been wanting to put together and address, and uh, so that we are meeting um, about those and our housing needs around our city. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we highlight all of the things that are going on. Uh, some, as the liaison to the Human Rights Committee, um, I wonder if we could talk about putting on the next uh, work uh, session, uh, member, membership qualifications, what qualifies as someone being a member versus not being a member, how that actually works. Um, I want to give an update on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Apparently, I want to get a, I want to get an update from the city administration. There's several projects, maybe 12 plus projects that are being held up or, or been delayed. Uh, there was some grant money to uh, improve, uh, I think, some of the sections on the east side of town, especially that um, that's there's been some type of delay with that. I like to get an update on that, please, um, and an update on the Rails and Trails project. Um, so the youth committee, that's the other one I'm a, a liaison for as far as updates go. On um, July the 9th, between 1 and 2, the governor's office has put out uh, their new initiative called Enough, and there is some statewide funding for youth um, to meet some poverty gaps, possible housing initiative stuff. So um, I'm going to be joining that on Zoom with Rachel Manning, who is the youth coordinator. So that's exciting. I'll be bringing some updates and some possible opportunities we will have with that initiative coming out. Um, and as always, um, always, if you are healthy enough, please donate blood. Uh, it's very, very important. There's also, uh, you could donate plasma. Uh, there's a, you can actually sell your plasma. Um, I cannot sell plasma, but I wish I need it often, but I can't sell my own plasma. But over on uh, College Avenue, there is a, a facility for plasma donations. Consider being um, an organ donor and please drive safely. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President. 
uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh, addressing, but I think it's, it's just unfortunate. Uh, and again, I know when I uh, took this role a few months ago, people said you have to have tough skin and broad shoulders, and I'm, you know, a hundred and four pounds, you know, soaking wet, and, and to be called a bully, I've never been called a bully in my life, and, and um, I think it's just unfortunate that just the word choices that some of us use, um, and, and it just, you know, I, I, some things, you know, words do matter in our word choices. So, you know, while we may disagree, and <laughs> man, while we may disagree, sometimes you have to uh, put those things aside. Make sure you're being kind, nevertheless. And uh, one thing that, you know, my mom always told me is that, you know, I, I didn't like that I have big teeth, but I would smile. And so I, I always smile through it all. And so even when I hear certain comments, I still just smile through it. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's just unfortunate what we do, and, and I think uh, with, I have two, two of my brothers here today, actually, Mayor Todd Knott from Pocomoke, uh, who is the, the uh, incoming president, president-elect for MML, and, and my brother, Spuddy Cephas, commissioner in Cambridge. So uh, thank you all for one being here and supporting, uh, and so I appreciate you all as being my municipal colleagues, but also my brothers as well. Uh, like my council member stated, we had a busy June, and uh, like, and I, I try to make each and every event, and I've done a pretty, we've all done a pretty good job. We've been at Visible and hot. I've gotten, like I said, sunburn. Now I have sunburn on my um, <laughs> arms, so to get, but I won't stop. I'll, I'll keep making those events, and I'll and uh, stay busy uh, as council members. That's why we did this. So I uh, appreciate you all for what you do. I appreciate the community, and I want to have a good, safe rest of our summer with all the events we have planned going on. To stay safe this 4th of July. July, um, come out to the red, white, and boom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, try not to do those things at your home. Be safe so that Chief Frampton and his crew are not busy this <laughs> yeah. uh, this this Thursday. So, uh, and with that, this work session is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.